Hello everyone, welcome back for another installment of Business Ethics Lectures. We're going to be talking about our second reading in the unit on social and economic justice. Um, and I'm excited for this one too. I, I, I love this unit in general. I like I, I talked a lot about this in my last lecture on Rawls, but the big picture stuff I think is, is really important um, to keep in mind whenever we're talking about very specific situations. Um, the social context of things, the, the underlying rules, that structure everything are worth critically rethinking. Um, my uh, on-campus class uh, had our uh, Rawls um, lecture on Tuesday, and I remember, and we kind of did a follow-up on Thursday a little bit. We had some leftover discussion that people wanted to ask questions about, and uh, a lot of the students in my on-campus class said that they found Rawls difficult, that his ideas were a little different and abstract and harder to get a grasp on. And so at one point in, the, in my lecture, I, I talked about, I wanted to share this with you. Uh, I was like, what's the main main takeaways from Rawls? That it, It's like if all the other stuff's confusing, like what's the big thing here? And part of it is about the idea of society as a system of cooperation and that for it to be a just system of cooperation, it has to be designed in a way that elicits this kind of universal buy-in from everyone. If I'm like asking you to participate in some scheme, I need to propose reasonable terms for your participation that, that respect your interests, this kind of thing. So I, I brought up that idea again. But I also brought up this idea that um, the whole discussion is important because we're so used to, I, I think, I think, that uh, very often we think about our life decision making and what behavior we're going to take and this sort of thing as, it, as if we take for granted all of the things about how our society is structured. That is, these are just the facts of life. This is just how life is. And this whole conversation about social and economic justice and like Rawls rethinking the basic foundations on which our system of society is grounded and justified uh, is kind of like a reminder to stick up for yourself, to like um, to to not just accept the status quo, but to rethink it. Be like, should we really be doing things the way that we're doing them? Sure, we're doing them this way. There's all this momentum. It's very hard to change, et cetera, et cetera. There's all sorts of practical problems. My my on campus class was talking a lot of the the present the student presentations people were giving were all about practical problems with Rawls. It's like in some ways it's kind of missing the point. Like the talk of social justice to give a theory of that is not to set up, here's a policy proposal th that we're going to send to the Senate or something, um, but to think about the standards by which we would critically evaluate what's going on and whether it's ideal or not. So to rethink those assumptions that we take for granted, the conditions of society that we just accept or can, uh, there's a temptation for just accepting blindly. I think is one reason why I get so jazzed about this topic and why I think it's worth talking about. And Nozick is going to sort of present a, a view of social and economic justice that might be more familiar to us, especially in America. Um, and so, but I want to I want to kind of emphasize how Rawls or Nozick is not just taking for granted the way our society is, and we shouldn't agree with him just on the grounds that this is what's familiar. We, um, Nozick is trying to take up the charge of having to give a justification for whatever system we're going to use. Uh, at the beginning of my lecture notes here, I say Nozick's position is, is named the entitlement theory. But if you did the reading, you know Nozick is really adamant about how entitlement is not a natural moral fact of reality. That whatever you are entitled to is an answer that will emerge after we have a theory of social justice, until we know what's the right way for this system of social cooperation to be set up, we don't know what you have rights to and what you don't have rights to, uh, when it, like in, especially when it comes to property rights, entitlements, things like that. So, um, ooh, sorry, give me a second. Okay. Um, so uh, he's, he's saying we, we couldn't talk about, oh, well, people are entitled to this, so therefore this is the correct system of cooperation. This would be the just society. He, he shares with Rawls this thing about how 
first we got to figure out what would the right rules be and then we'll be able to talk about what people are entitled to um, so there isn't some sort of basic entitlement that Nozick is premising so he's on the same page as Rawls here on on having the discussion in kind of the way that I was presenting Rawls as framing it I mean he doesn't have this whole original position thing he doesn't have the maxi min principle not the veil of ignorance but in terms of why we need to ask the question in the first place, Nozick is on the same page. And in fact, another very for Nozick and Rawls are like cats and dogs. They fight against each other. They the they're contemporaries to each other, and um, they had a lot of public debates against each other. They were kind of um, they were two of the most prominent theoretical proposals for how we should think about social justice in the 20th century, and they were alive at the same time. Their works are in direct competition with each other, so there's a lot of disagreement between them, and and we've talked. There's been a lot of conversation around that disagreement, but there are some interesting things that they both agree on, and one of those things is that um, you know when when Rawls says that it doesn't matter how elegant or efficient a system a, a social system is, if it's unjust, it doesn't matter. And Nozick would be like, yeah, I agree with that. It doesn't, uh, I mean, his whole theory, if you look at it at the end of the day, he's not saying that a system of, of social construction that is the most efficient is the one that is that we're going to choose in favor of that efficiency. Um, it's still a matter of justice for Nozick. Um, another thing I think, uh, this came up in my class when I lectured on Nozick with my on-campus students yesterday, um, uh, Nozick is a libertarian. He and he, in fact, he's kind of like in the 20th century, the the like um, Moses <laughs> or something, the Jesus of libertarianism. He's like the, the the Buddha or something, like this prominent central figure that's a representative of the whole philosophical position. Um, he definitely is that. His his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which is where you got your selections from is like the Bible of libertarianism. And political libertarians today, uh, like I've seen so many interviews with politicians who are like self-described libertarians, like Paul Ryan and people like this, um, who are like anarchy state and utopia, like this is like my Bible. <laughs> so Nozick is a very good representative of this, but he is not really in favor of a meritocratic system of justice. This came up in my conversation with my students yesterday. Um, he um, he's not saying something like people who put more effort in or do more work should be deserved. Or they deserve to get more social benefits as a result, or or this kind of moral criticism of laziness or something like that. In fact, Nozick is going to be his entitlement theory is going to be a little bit closer to when Pojman was talking about gifts. If you remember that from back from the affirmative action unit, Pojman says, "You give me a gift." I can do what I want with that. That's my it's my thing now. If you give it to me, it doesn't matter if I earned it or not. Um, it's just to say I have rights to that thing, even if it was given to me as a gift and I didn't work for it or something like that. Nozick's got a very similar thing going on here. Okay, um, so that's a, that's some um, uh, preliminary stuff here, though. Um, so uh, so let's let's start getting into some more of the details. Thinking, just me saying, Nozick's a libertarian. If you know anything about libertarianism, it's a good frame of reference for you. Um, if you don't know anything about libertarians, like political libertarians, um, this might be important to know. Um, I, I can do some other filling in about this. Libertarians in politically generally stand for open free markets, unregulated markets, no government oversight, small government. Um, the more that government gets involved in people's lives, the worse. Libertarians care about personal freedom more than anything else. And even if it's for altruistic goals, they're kind of opposed to it. So even if a government is imposing some law that restricts how people can buy and sell things on the market, we generally want to avoid that, even if the things that are being restricted are bad. So but libertarians are on a spectrum here, but the most extreme libertarians are getting real close to anarchy. That they would say things like, um, like, you shouldn't have any laws against drugs. Like, heroin should not be illegal. If people choose to use heroin, so be it. That's their problem. 
the government shouldn't be like stepping in and forcing people to be good Samaritans or things like that. Um, that the, 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 that extreme libertarian position doesn't say that these things aren't bad or even that certain actions aren't immoral. They just think it should be a part of personal responsibility and freedom to use your freedom in the right way. The, the fact that people will make moral mistakes does not justify something like the government stepping in and interfering with people's freedom directly to make sure they make the right choice. This kind of paternalistic model of the state is what they're opposed to. Nozick is not on the mo most extreme end. So in other words, even like the really extreme libertarians are like, um, the government shouldn't even be responsible for keeping up roads maintenance or funding a fire department or public services like that. They're, that should all be done locally by people in your community privately funding it. Um, if the government didn't repair roads anymore, people would make it happen. They'd be forced to. We'd have to figure out a way to make that happen, and that would be better than the government just stepping in unilaterally. Um, if we didn't have fire departments, we'd have fire brigades. There'd be local people in the community who would organize to make sure that that happens. Um, that's that's kind of the most extreme end of libertarianism. Nozick isn't for that. He doesn't go all that way. Um, but he definitely is for uh, less is more kind of thing. Like the the less we can we need to rely on the state to do all this sort of stuff, the better. So he's still a, he has the general libertarian model here of prioritizing freedom and liberty as the central value of social justice uh, and concerned about any other thing, any other proposal about social justice that starts interfering with that. So that's what we're going to see here. But when it comes to economic justice, uh, Nozick frames things like this. He says, if you're going to have a theory of social justice with regard to economic justice, um, it's going to have to answer a few questions. One, it's going to have to address justice and acquisition. How do people end up rightfully and justly acquiring things, you know, taking as property, things that are previously not owned? In many cases today, that isn't, doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> I mean, the number of places in this world that aren't owned, like think land, like the amount of land that's unowned, how does it become owned? I mean, everything's owned by someone. It's very hard to find any piece of land that's not owned by someone or some entity or some organization or something like that, some community. Um, but there are some there are some things about acquiring uh, property, like say patents, like intellectual property. Um, there can be um, ooh, new discoveries that are made. Um, I mean, one thing is, um, there's a kind of questions about this. Uh, there are certain, you've heard this under the moniker of externalities, like no one owns the atmosphere. Um, it's just a public resource, right? But people can, especially businesses, can use up that resource in the sense of pollution. Like the atmosphere is a carbon sink. And how much carbon are you going to be putting in it um, is sort of a, a kind of resource. Some governments have proposed that um, there should be like a carbon tax in the sense that everyone is entitled to a certain amount, uh, every business gets a certain entitlement about how many emissions, how much emission, carbon emissions they're allowed to uh, put into the atmosphere and companies can buy and sell this from each other. So like if we're allowed so much carbon emissions and we're not using it, we can sell it to some other company who wants to pollute more. Uh, and this is a way to try to regulate pollution to make sure people aren't just dumping whatever they want. Um, but that would be to make this resource, uh, which is not owned, into something that can be owned and bought and sold on the market and all that kind of stuff. So that would be a matter of justice and acquisition. But you can also go back in history and be like, okay, how did some resource become owned that wasn't owned? Like the neem tree example, actually, from Warhain in uh, international business would be a good example. The neem trees were just there. Everyone was using them. No one owned them. The indigenous poor just go and use them whenever they want. But then Nemix acquires them, and now that shuts off access because now it's private property kind of thing. So that would be justice and acquisition. How would that happen appropriately? Justice and transfer is... What are the parameters of justice with respect to how something that is owned is transferred to somebody else? 
And a really obvious example of injustice in transfer is just straight up stealing. So if I just, you own it and then I take it and now I own it, that's not an appropriate transfer. A uh, transfer that happens under um, deliberate misinformation uh, or misleading statements is fraud. Fraud is not a just transfer of property. Okay, if, if the transfer happens under the auspices of fraud, then that's not just. Those are simple examples. Um, uh, bribery, um, um, extortion I put here, uh, like, like um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I'm totally blanking. Um, Not, um, <laughs> my poor brain. This is just a stupid thing. It'll come to me. Um, blackmail. Blackmail. Why can't I think of that word? Blackmailing someone is going to involve a transfer, but not in a just sort of way. Okay, but um, taken, taken together, these constraints about justice and acquisition and just in, justice and transfer, those define what you're entitled to. You're not entitled to property that you stole. You're not entitled to property that you acquired through fraud. This kind of stuff. Okay, so once we've got these rules about justice, economic justice, now we're in a position to make a claim about entitlement. Before that, there is no sense of entitlement that makes sense at all. Okay, there's also one other category that Nozick adds here. Rectification of injustice in holdings. So these first two rules are like, Here's how things should happen, ideally. What if they don't happen that way? What if unjust things happen? I steal from you. I commit fraud. How do we fix that? How do we address that injustice that's happened? And this is where things get really tough with, say, affirmative action, right? There's definitely been injustice in holdings that's part of the legacy of slavery and uh, racism and sexism and all this kind of, and oppression in general. Um, what do we do about that? How do we fix that? It definitely has an economic component to it in terms of social opportunities, wages, et cetera, et cetera. How do we fix that? If your great grand grand great 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 grandparents or something made a bunch of money as slave owners and then through inheritance that's been passed down to you, I mean that's an injustice in holdings. What are we gonna do about that? That's a question. Okay. This doesn't presuppose anything controversial. This is Nozick just framing the debate. Any theory of social justice that deals with economic, the economic aspect of society is gonna have to deal with these questions. Okay, now here's where things get into controversy. Nozick sets up this contrast in ways we could answer those questions. And he, he has this process versus product kind of distinction. He calls the theories the historical principles of social justice versus time slice or end result principles of social justice. When, if we're, and the historical one is the one he, his theory is going, he's going to take that path. So he thinks that's the right way to think about principles of economic justice. Basically that in order to figure out whether a holding is just or not just, whether you are entitled to a certain property, uh, you have to ask the question, how did you, how did you get that? Um, how did you, what was the process by which this thing came into your ownership? And that will tell you whether it's just or unjust. The end result or time slice principles do something different. They think about a distribution of resources, what you hold, what you don't hold, as just, just depending on the features or properties of that distribution. Like who has wh how much. And it ignores how that distribution came about. Um, there's, there's some questions. I mean, Nozick thinks that Rawls falls into the second case, and that's why he's a problem. There's some question here, I think, about whether Rawls does fall into that second case. And the reason for that is that, um, remember how much emphasis I put in the lecture and how much Rawls put in his readings about how the process by which we come to the principles of social justice matters a lot. Like all this stuff about the original position and the veil of ignorance is like a pretty big deal uh, in terms of uh, having a foundation for social justice to Rawls. That sounds a little bit like process to me. Um, but definitely the rules that we would decide on under the original position, especially the Maxi-Min principle, 
is um, more of a product type of answer. It's more of an end result or time slice principle sort of answer. And Nozick's going to criticize those. Um, let's talk more about what those end result time slice principles, how they actually work though, what the details of those kinds of theories, um, what formal structure they have. And that's going to be this idea of patterning that Nozick talks about. Um, thanks for joining us, Li Ling. I'm happy you're here. How are things going? Oh, awesome. <laughs> At work. <laughs> um, well, I'll take that as a compliment that I'm um, a more interesting way to spend your time than working. Maybe there's a business ethical question about that, though. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, cool. Well, thanks for joining. I'm happy there's, I'm always happy when there's someone here and I'm not just talking to myself in the box. So I appreciate that. Okay. So let's, uh, I'm a, I'm a 20 minutes into my lecture right now, Leeling, just to let you know where I'm at. Um, if you're, if you do have my lecture notes up, I'm in the section that's entitled Contrasts and Categories of Principles of Social Justice um, under Nozick. So we're talking about Nozick here. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Okay, so the, this idea of patterning. Uh, oh, uh, let me do this first. Let me give you an, uh, just a really simple example of what these end result or time slice principle theories would look like. And this might be a straw man. In fact, I, I, I kind of personally think this is a straw man. Um, there's a more reasonable version of this proposal. Rawls is definitely doing way better than this proposal. But even people like um, Bernie Sanders who might talk this way, I think they've got a more robust position than what I'm about to give you. But this is just for illustrative purposes. So it's kind of a straw man, but it, I think it'll get us in the ballpark. Maybe you've heard people talk about the whole 99% sort of movement. That just the fact that 1% of our population owns an overwhelming majority of our overall economy and overall wealth, and that the 99% of like most people, the overall majority of people own a very small fraction of the overall wealth and economy. Some people look at that fact and just say, yeah, see, there's injustice happening. That's kind of like how the end result thing would say. It just the fact of wealth inequality is something in itself unjust. That would be kind of like the proposal uh, that um, Nozick is going to be criticizing here. And so in some ways I'm thinking, Nozick's arguments against this proposal are maybe straw man arguments, but we'll have to be careful about that evaluation. We don't want to jump the gun on saying um, Nozick is straw manning either. That might be to straw man Nozick. So we got to be careful about that. But there could be a concern about this. Certainly the just the bare thing of like people have different amounts of money, so things are unjust seems just too simplistic. It's ignoring a lot of other moral issues and moral realities. But that's also not even everything that Nozick is going to complain about it. But let's take a look at this. You could start to tweak that model and make it more sophisticated. Um, even a meritocracy will do this. And a meritocracy is very different than just looking at wealth inequality. But it'd be something like people should be rewarded based on their effort and what they put into things. People who do more work should earn more money. People who do less work should earn less money. People that develop themselves into being more skilled applicants should have access to more jobs and better paying jobs than people who have not put that investment and time in, the schooling, the training, the experience, et cetera. Okay? So um, uh, even a meritocracy would fit into this pattern pattern that Nozick is talking about. And I like this way he puts it of like, this kind of way of thinking about uh, distributive economic justice would be like, each according to their blank, whatever that blank is. So each according to existence would be our first proposal of just like, if there's any wealth inequality, then that's something unjust. If you just exist and you're in society, then boom, you deserve the same as everyone else. That'd be, that, again, I think that's a straw man, but um, there's plenty of other things we could care about here. But that would be an each according to existence. A meritocracy would say each according to their effort um, or each according to their qualifications um, or 
each according to their ability to create or to contribute to the efficiency of society overall. Um, I don't know if this reference lands for anyone, um, but the old Heinlein novel, science fiction novel, uh, Starship Troopers, is uh, like, like a, a almost like a, a fictional version of Nozick, um, but with a heavy, heavy dose of meritocracy built into it. It's actually kind of fascist, but <laughs> um, there, there's a lot of libertarian ideals that are in that book. It, the movie is nothing like the book, by the way, other than that it toys around with fascism um, as a theme. Um, Starship Troopers, the movie, is not the book. The, but the book is this, uh, it does have a bug war going on, but one of the core ideas is that citizenship is not given to people. You have to earn the right to be a citizen of the society. So to be able to vote, to be able to contribute uh, in uh, positions of power and influence, um, you have to earn your citizenship. And a lot of people earn their citizens citizenship through military service in Starship Troopers. And that's kind of the general story. Um, that would be like a each according to their ability to contribute to society. So you have to do something to contribute to society in order for society to be acknowledging you or being concerned about you or, or distributing these benefits of social cooperation. That could be another pattern, right? Um, but you could put anything in here, each according to their need. That's like the early uh, Christian church um, in history, like right after Jesus died in the early church there. They were a communist um, in the sense of commune, definitely, and communist too, but not they weren't thinking Marxist, of course, is Christianity, a very different paradigm. But um, the whole idea of the early Christian church was everyone sold all their possessions and threw the money into a common pot, and then people were given that money as they had need. So it'd be each according to their need. That'd be another pattern, potentially. So there's a lot of options here. But Nozick says they all boil down to the same kind of logic. Um, they have uh, some sort of variable that they're sensitive to that then we're going to distribute benefits and burdens of society in accordance with that pattern. So um, Nozick is like, I don't like that idea. Here's my suggestion. No pattern. And this is where you get the kind of idea of libertarianism. There isn't some regulatory principle here that's determining how people get this stuff. Um, he, uh, like I have this in the notes. You make it, you get it. I do think that there is a pattern, and Nozick seems to recognize this too, but let's not make it a semantic dispute. It's still true that Nozick is trying to eliminate or weed out any sort of extra conditions that we might put on this each according to their blank kind of thing. So he, uh, there's this quote from the reading. He says, from each according to what they choose to do, to each according to what they make for themselves, perhaps with the contracted aid of others, and what others choose to do for them and choose to give them of what they've been given previously under this maxim and haven't yet expended or transferred. So I can't, I can't give you something I've already sold to somebody else, for example. Boiled down, he's got this slogan, from each as they choose to each as they are chosen. So that's it. No, no extra conditions on there. And this is why I related it to Pojman's idea of a gift. Okay, so we don't care about um, what you've got, um, or what is what are your sort of personality or features or usefulness or anything like that, uh, but it's just like whatever people choose to do. There is still a moral value here, though, and that's freedom, right? We're giving people maximum uh, leeway in terms of what they choose to do. Now, Nozick, when he brings this up, he says, if you're paying attention you know that this answer can't be this simple. Um, he says the astute reader will, will see that this slogan is not satisfactory, even though he's proposing this as a general idea. It's got to be fixed a little bit, and it has to be argued for. That's what the rest of my lecture is going to talk about. The first thing, um, so there's kind of two uh, sections of my, the, my remaining lecture for you today. One of them is why are patterned end result time slice principle approaches to social justice wrong according to Nozick? And that's actually, it boils down to a pretty simple argument, and I'll give you that. The second part, though, is going to be about how this from each as they choose to each as they are chosen is too simplistic, and Nozick recognizes it, and he wants to fix that. And this is going to be uh, related to the part of the reading that was probably the most difficult, be my guess, 
And that's all this discussion of, of Locke, John Locke's uh, theory of justice, and uh, the Lockean proviso, this little extra condition that we got to put on from each as they choose to each as they are chosen kind of thing. Um, and, and we'll bring it back full circle with what we talked about at the beginning of the lecture here about justice in acquisition, justice in transfer. Okay, so that's the game plan for the remaining lecture. Let's talk about the argument. The main argument for why, um, I, oh, I'm just going to label these. Uh, so let's go back here. Uh, the patterned approach to social justice or the end result or time slice principles, I'm just going to call that um, social liberalism. Um, that's not a perfect label, uh, but it's kind of the like classic competitor to libertarian views, which is what Nozick's defending. And... Um, at least with a lot of the examples, social liberalism is like the perfect label for a lot of the proposals that fit that kind of model. Um, so just for ease of reference and to set up uh, the discussion with Cohen that I'll be doing next week um, on Monday's lecture, uh, I'm going to use those terms. So social liberalism is Nozick's opponent here, the patterned version, the end result time slice principle kind of proposal. And libertarianism or the entitlement theory, that's Nozick's position that's going to talk about the historical principles, the how did a distribution come about, the process. Okay, so what's Nozick's complaint or objection to social liberalism? It's this. If you're going to have this to each as based on this blah, whatever that variable is, if you're going to actually follow that principle, the only way it's going to happen is with constant interference, continuous interference in people's lives and in their liberty and in their freedom by the government. There's no way to make it happen other than this way. So uh, just a, kind of a, for an illustration here and to frame this Wilt Chamberlain argument because this is his main argument. It, the Wilt Chamberlain thought experiment is a way to demonstrate in an illustration this prediction that Nozick is making that uh, social liberalism always leads to continuous violations of liberty and freedom. Um, to frame this up a little bit, think back to affirmative action and equal opportunity, the notion of equal opportunity. Um, there might be this idea that we got to get things to a place of equality um, and then once, like, okay, actually let me frame this up a little differently. Let me start over. So we look at what's happening right now. Uh, if, if there's a race, like a competition in society for the best positions, best benefits, money, the market, everything, um, some people have an advantage on others when we talk about privilege and things like that. Um, and other people are at a disadvantage or stigma or something like that. That because of historical oppression, we're not all starting from the same starting line. Some people got a head start. That's not equal opportunity. That's not fair. That's not a fair competition, we might say. And the hope might be, well, let's uh, solve that. Let's get people to the equal starting line, and then we'll go, bang, start the race, and then everything will be fair and just. We'll have equal opportunity. Everything will be great. So we just have to do this intervention now to get things equal, and then it'll be a fair competition, and then there we go. Then we're off to the races. No pun intended. Um, now, there are things going on with affirmative action that are very, very different from here. And social inequality and issues about racism, sexism, et cetera, are not exactly the same as the issues of the social liberal, uh, this like concern about wealth inequality and stuff like that. But I think that's a useful frame of reference in the, in the model of maybe we can make an intervention, make things equal, and then we can go back to our usual way of doing things and everything will be just moving forward. So imagine that that happens. Imagine the government is like, wow, there's been a lot of injustice in the past. All these distributions of holdings are unjust. Let's just even it all out. So there's this massive 100% tax that happens in 2019. Everyone's money, all their assets are taken away, appropriated by the government, and then redistributed. And for the most part, you keep what you have, um, but there's only some things that have to change. So people who are super wealthy have to give up some of their property. They have to give up some of their wealth that they got in the bank. 
and that gets redistributed to other people as tax breaks or whatever, right? So there's there's this re this really radical redistribution of property, and now everyone has the same money and great. Now let, and then we'll just keep doing free market capitalism, okay? It's not going to work. We're going to get back to the same kind of wealth inequality, just naturally. It's like every time we try to make it equal, it's going to start drifting. And then we got to make it equal and drifting. And that, I'm not going to tell the whole Wilt Chamberlain argument here, but the point is that even if we imagine everything equal at the beginning, people like Wilt Chamberlain can do what they want to here and say, hey, well, I'm not going to play unless I get the 25 cents on any, any ticket. And then everyone's like, well, you know what? That's worth it to me. I'll pay that extra 25 cents. And now suddenly Wilt Chamberlain has tons of money and everyone else is poorer than him. Um, then if we really believe in this patterned version of social justice, each according to blank, if we just thought something like basic wealth inequality is a problem, then we're going to have to do this crazy tax thing all over again immediately. Okay, So that's the point that Nozick is going for. If we think a just society is a society that bears a certain pattern, the only way to maintain that pattern because it's going to drift. It's going to get away from that pattern. The only way to maintain that pattern is by constant interference, continual interference from the government about what you can do with your money and what you can't. Or if you make these choices, we're going to take them away. I mean, just imagine how, I mean, I think this is part of Nozick's, uh, the intuitive support for his position. Imagine how would you spend your money or what would you do with your time? How would you invest your time in entrepreneurial projects and stuff like that if you knew that no matter how much work you do, um, the extra profit that you make is just going to be taken away anyway and redistributed to everybody? Or if you just spend all your money frivolously, you know, the next time the government steps in, they're going to hand you a bunch of money. You didn't do anything for it. Like a lot of, I think it, there's a certain intuition here that the economy would just fall apart. I mean, no one would do anything anymore. Now, we've talked before about motivation and that uh, concern about survival or greed are not the only motivators for why people would be involved in things. We've talked about weird, uh, I think I brought up post-scarcity societies before. Oh, maybe that was in my other class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I talked about this with all of you. Uh, I played a clip from a Star Trek the Next Generation, Star Trek, Star Trek Next Generation episode, because in Star Trek, like, it's a, it's a post-scarcity economy. Um, people don't need to work to survive. Um, because there's uh, cheap energy, cheap sustainable energy. They've got matter replicators, so they can just make food out of inert material whenever they want. Um, there's no money system anymore in Star Trek, um, but people still work at things, and they, you know, serve in Starfleet. They serve these scientific expeditions. They serve in the military. They serve in political positions because they want to, because they want to contribute to things of value. But Certainly, th even with those arguments on the table, that there are other motivators other than just fear of s not being able to survive or greed that I want to just have more profit for myself selfishly, even if there are other motivators, I think Nozick might have a point here that this kind of continuous uh, and repeated interference and um, intervention by the government to redistribute wealth would not create a functional economy. Okay? But really the problem for him is less about whether it's a functional economy or not, but whether it's a just one. And the big issue for Nozick is that interfering with people's freedom in this uh, extreme of a way is not just. There are questions about that. Uh, we'll see Cohen talk about that next time. But, but that's, that's the big concern that, that Nozick has here. Okay. Um, I say here in my lecture notes, from here on out, keep the comparison with Rawls on the back burner. And there's actually a very interesting reason for this. Maybe I'll let the cat out of the bag right now. Nozick is putting his positive position in the basket of uh, liberty and freedom. And all libertarians do this. Um, they're like, that's the chief moral good here that needs to be prioritized above even things like well-being. If people fall through the cracks of a free society, or overall quality of life is not as high as it could be, that's better than living in a big brother state in which you don't have any personal freedom, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of like, I don't know if this reference works for anybody, but uh, I know this is on a lot of like high school English reading lists. 
But if you've ever read Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, that's kind of the sentiment of that book, that it's better to be free and have a harder, more inconvenient existence or quality of life than to have all the comforts uh, and needs taken care of, but no personal liberty, no real freedom. Um, that's kind of the liber a libertarian mindset here. But what's really interesting is that as Nozick goes forward in his dealings with objections here and how to fix up the theory to make it good, he ends up starting to talk about things that are not just about liberty and freedom and do have to do with well-being. And I think it's interesting to think about whether Nozick's reasoning is something that people under Rawls's original position under the veil of ignorance would find compelling or not. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Rawls and Nozick are classic antagonists. There's a lot of ways in which they're really approaching the question of social justice in radically different ways. There are some things they agree on, but there's also ways in which they're approaching it in very different directions, and their analysis is proceeding from different assumptions. But um, it's interesting to kind of anticipate how would they interact, and what are they? How would they maybe? Th maybe they're both of them are contributing some useful insights. How do you put the pieces together? I think that's really worth thinking about. Um, I'm not going to belabor this lecture by going through all the kind of stuff that I think about that, but as maybe uh, food for future thought. If, you, if you're interested in social justice and finding these readings and ideas interesting and compelling, there's a lot of fun stuff to do with comparing Rawls and Nozick against each other. So uh, I think that is useful. Just keep him on the back burner here. Okay, so going back here, um, Nozick is proposing this kind of from each as they choose to each as they are chosen. But he says himself in the reading, that's not going to be a good enough answer. It's got some huge problems. Well, here's some problems. Um, and this is stuff that Locke, way back in the 17th, 18th century, was concerned about too, as he was trying to build out a kind of view of liberal values. Maybe not social liberalism, maybe more libertarian, but just this kind of new... Um, uh, enthusiasm for egalitarianism and human dignity and human rights that was happening in the Enlightenment period in Europe. Um, Locke is a part of that tradition and so he's thinking about personal liberty and the economy um, rather than it being this um, oligarchy or aristocracy or something like that. Um, what would be a more just society? And he's got uh, Nozick and Locke are kind of similar on some stuff. But Locke recognizes a theoretical dilemma that Nozick is sort of like, yeah, that's a problem. Locke uh, gives us some of the help, though, for solving it, but not all of it. Okay, so how, let's frame this up. <clears throat> so in, in some ways, what Nozick is doing at this stage in the game is trying to clean up his proposal to make it uh, more immune to certain objections and concerns. So let's go back to justice and acquisition. How can I justly acquire ownership of something that is unowned? One idea, and this is Locke's, this is one of Locke's most famous suggestions, is that you acquire a right to own something unowned by mixing your labor with it. So, like as Nozick points out, we generally think of labor as undesirable. Some people might think it is desirable. That's part of, I think, Captain Picard's point in the Star Trek clip that I showed my students. But it's like, um, Picard says things like, uh, we have other values for why we want to work at something other than personal benefit. That being able to like contribute to society or to benefit the lives of other people or progress humanity's understanding of reality like through scientific uh, understanding or philosophical inquiry or stuff like that, that that's something valuable that we might value for its own sake regardless of whether we're getting paid for it or not. But we also maybe have this intuition that labor is undesirable. It's not something we want to do. We'd rather be lazy or something like that. Uh, and so there needs to be some kind of incentive uh, for um, investment um, in society. And that, uh, that compensation is giving you property rights. You now can acquire a kind of power that you didn't have before by making this contribution. So... Um, Take, uh, I, I'm going to use this example quite a bit uh, for this whole section. Imagine that we live in a village together and we don't really have um, a money economy or just starting out on a money economy. Um, but for the most part, our conditions of life are marked by hunting and gathering. Um, 
and maybe a little communal agriculture, uh, but not a whole lot. Um, ac actually, let's, let's make it cleaner. No agriculture yet, because that's going to be part of the twist of this. So there's an orchard nearby our village where people go and gather fruit whenever they're hungry. So it's just a resource there, kind of like the neem tree uh, example. Whenever people want, they can just go and pick some fruit and eat it um, free. Right? There isn't any writers on that. But then I'm like, you know what? These fruits are pretty good, but I bet I could make them better by tending to them. So now we're starting to get a little bit more like agriculture, right? So I spend some of my days um, putting my hard labor into tending to, the, to some of the trees in the orchard. And, and my fruits, uh, they're, they're fruits of my labor, no pun, uh, pun intended. Um, all the effort that I put into it results in the fruits from those trees that I've tended being more delicious and succulent and nutritious and all this good stuff. So, um, it seems like since I put all that work into it, I should be entitled, by that mean property ownership, to what happens with the fruit. And if I want to sell it to people, to everyone else, all of you in the village, that's my right. So that would be kind of like Locke's proposal. I mix my labor with, this, with the tree, and now I ac acquire it. Okay? It wasn't owned before, but as soon as I do that, now I get ownership of it. It's got some kind of plausibility to it. Is it true that I, I gain this ownership entitlement because I mix what I own with what I don't? Um, sometimes that's been given, uh, that, that's a construction that's been put on Locke's proposal because I have a right to my body, naturally. I have human rights of autonomy, bodily autonomy. So I own my body, I own my life. If I want to use that, take that thing I own and mix it my la through labor with something else, then I acquire ownership of it. But Nozick's like, that doesn't make any sense. And that's his soup can, his tomato, ju tomato juice example. It's like, I got a can of tomato juice. I make it radioactive so I can track the molecules. And then I pour it into the ocean, and it diffuses itself into the ocean. Does that mean I own the ocean? No, that's silly. doesn't make any sense. So that doesn't make sense. How about that uh, I acquire this ownership because I've improved the value of the thing? Like the fruits that I have uh, from the trees I've tended are more valuable than the fruits from the trees I didn't tend. Um, I put this cost to increase the value of the fruits. Now, nah, that's not going to work, though. Um, because all I'd be entitled to would be the added value, not the original value like the, that the fruits would have if I didn't tend to them. And, and that would be impractical to try to separate out the thing, uh, the added value from the natural value. That, that's just not going to work for a social system. So Nozick kind of just says, yeah, we're just going to allow for this on the grounds um, that it actually kind of improves things for everybody else. That society, and this is where keeping Rawls on the back burner is interesting, society has a vested interest in giving me this property right. Even though it's taking out away access to some other people, now you have to pay to get my fruit. That's actually kind of an advantage for people in the village, for all of you. Because if you want to go and get the normal fruits, they're free, they're still free, you can get the normal fruits whenever you want. But if you want those succulent fruits, you can pay me for it. And how does that improve your situation? Now you got options. And let's say um, Li Ling's here in the chat, so I'll use you as an example. Let's say Li Ling decides that she's like, oh, I see what Tim's doing over there. And uh, Tim's making these uh, fruit trees better and selling the fruit. You know what? I can do a better job than Tim can. I'm going to tend to some of the other fruits in the orchard uh, and make them even better than Tim's. And maybe you do, Li Ling. Maybe you're better at gardening than I am. And now the competition between us also gives benefit to the rest of the people in the village because now they have even more options for the fruit that they want. And they're like, you know what, today I'm willing to pay for one of Tim's fruits, but Li Ling's are better, and so she's charging more. I'm not going to pay that extra one. And the competition will keep the prices down, and that's going to be good for everyone else in the village too. So, but, but the primary thing, I mean, because the price, keeping prices down, it could be argued, well, Giving any ownership is worsening people's situation because now they have to pay for it. So the main argument here, so Nozick doesn't want to argue that way. The main argument is just that by having private property and encouraging investment, now people in the village have more options. They have more freedom. 
They can make choices about things that they couldn't make choices about before. They have access to things they couldn't have access to before. I can have devices now through research and development that people invested in. I can buy things like tablets. I couldn't do that before. You know, in, in Locke's day, you didn't have tablets. I mean, they had stone tablets maybe, but not, not iPads and things like that. So that's the logic. That's the ultimate theoretical basis um, for this kind of free market capitalism and private property. Not just that competition improves things, something to that, but also that just having more choices for everybody else is a social benefit. Now, it's possible, though, that giving private property ownership to someone could be a problem for everybody else. Let's go on this example. So I tend to some plants or some of the trees in the orchard and then Li Ling starts doing it, and then other people start doing it. And eventually, there's going to be someone at the very end who's going to acquire or take ownership of the last remaining unowned trees in the orchard. Now, that's a problem. Why? Because that last person is taking away opportunities from everyone else in the village. They're taking away the opportunity of having access to the free fruit. And that was kind of the, like the thing that was of concern in the neem tree uh, area. When Nemex takes control of it, now the indigenous population doesn't have access to it. And they're too poor to buy Nemex, right, the replacement. Even though Nemex is more efficient, it has a longer shelf life, it's more effective, doesn't matter if people don't have access to it, if they don't have the freedom to gain that resource. So that's the concern here. Um, with Locke's proviso. So if it's okay for you to acquire something unowned by mixing your labor with it, as long as that acquisition does not worsen the situation of others. There's also a way in which we could talk about um, losing the opportunity to improve by a, a acquisition. So the last person who takes the last trees, now no one else has the space to take trees anymore because there's no more unowned ones. That's less economic opportunity. That's less freedom. Um, there's also the concern about competition worsening people's situations. Like, I'm much happier when I'm the only one gardening the trees than when Li Ling shows up and starts doing it better than me. Drives my prices down. That's a problem, right? Um, but these are different ways we could understand worsen the situation of others. And there's a potential paradox here because if the last person can't acquire the last trees because they're depriving other people of an opportunity, then the next to the last person can't do it because that deprives the opportunity of the person to acquire the last ones. And so, and then the third to the last one, and then the fourth to the last one, and then all the way back to the original person who first acquired it. The paradox here is that if we include this proviso that you can't worsen the situation of others, then it might turn out that no one is able to acquire property ever. And that seems absurd. That kind of defeats the whole purpose of the idea that you should acquire property by mixing your labor with it. Um, the proviso ends up shutting up any possibility of a just acquisition. Uh, that's absurd. Something's gone wrong here. How do we fix this? Nozick wants to fix it, and he thinks we can. Um, and he, So he generally likes Locke's system. He just wants to kind of tweak it so that we don't get this weird paradox. The first thing that he's going to say is, well, let's clarify what we mean by worsen the situation of others. First, let's eliminate the idea of losing the opportunity to improve yourself by a, a future acquisition. So by not taking the last trees, um, uh, taking the last trees is, is not a problem if that means now no one else is able to take the trees. That's, that's, so that'll slow the regress down a little bit here. Um, but we also maybe want to eliminate this condition about losing the freedom to use what was previously available for free. So uh, Nozick wants to say there's not really a way in which people are really worsened if that last person takes property ownership of the last trees in the orchard and there's no more free ones. Um, why though? He has to defend that because it certainly seems like a loss, right? There's an option I no longer have. Um, so so here, uh, Nozick in my lecture notes, I say, the more interesting question here is whether or not those who can no longer appropriate are worsened by a system allowing permanent property. Because, like I mentioned earlier, this is really the state that we're in. 
we're in this position in society right now where there's almost nothing that isn't owned. So is that a problem? Is there something unjust about that arrangement? Because now we, we don't have free resources floating around. You always have to deal with the system of someone else's ownership and their power and control, and that lowers your influence. Um, is this a restriction on freedom that should trouble us if we're libertarians who care about freedom? Nozick says no. And he says no for some really interesting reasons. He says, this is all about worsening people's situations, right? Well, if we're going to look at worsening, we've got to counterbalance that with all the ways in which they benefit. So if we allow private property ownership, and there's no more freedom to acquire new property, and there's no free commune sorts of things for us to gain access to whenever we want, um, what do we get from this? First, it increases social product by giving means of production to those who can use them the most efficiently. Um, this is a classic libertarian sort of belief or faith in free markets, that people who are going to be effective at managing the means of production are going to stay in business. The people who aren't are going to fail and get bought out, et cetera, et cetera, by the people who maybe can. So it's always this constant, um, the market sort of weeding out bad management. <laughs> Um, and encouraging and promoting good management. The other advantage here is that it encourages experimentation. So there's not one, this isn't like totalitarian communism where there's one committee overseeing everything. Um, that would maybe discourage risk taking um, and experimentation. We're just trying to lock a system in and just keep doing it as long as it works. Um, by having private property ownership where people are allowed to do whatever they want with what they own, then they can make choices to try out new things um, because they're only just taking on personal risk, which kind of gets into the next point. Enables people to decide on the risks and so promotes specialized risk bearing. So in one sense, society benefits from uh, risky entrepreneurship, like uh, uh, research and development, trying out something new, experimenting, and maybe we'll find a better way of doing things than we've done them before. Innovation. Right? So there's that, uh, there's that value. But also, um, because people get to decide individually what sort of risks they want to take on with how they use their money, now we can create systems where certain risks are things that people can become specialists at. And this is actually what you see with insurance companies. The whole idea of insurance companies is that you don't have to be personally liable for all the risks that are involved in your business. If something goes wrong, You've got insurance to cover you for it. The insurance company is taking on all of the risk from everyone who pays dues into the insurance fund and then uses that money to pay out any insurance claims that are required um, when something does go wrong. So in other words, if insurance doesn't exist, then all it takes is one bad thing to happen in my business, like workplace accident or something like that. I get sued, I'm screwed. Bankruptcy. <clears throat> but because the insurance company exists, it gives me this safety net, so I don't have to worry about that. I want to avoid bad things from happening because the insurance company is definitely going to punish me financially in some way, but it's not going to be this kind of fatal blow that will totally destroy my industry or my business. So that creates market stability, which is also something that is a social good, um, giving people the ability to count on um, certain goods and services being available. Once we have specialization happening in the marketplace, now if my local grocer goes out of business, where am I going to get my food, right? So I want stable market conditions so that I don't have all those fears that I have to deal with. Uh, he talks about how it protects future persons by reserving resources. In other words, our own greed will make us... Um, conservative about how we're managing the resources that we have. If a small, um, if wealth distribution is unequal in society, then we're not just going to use everything that we have. Um, but some people are going to hoard it, and that means that there will be resources in the future available to future generations. An interesting argument. Um, whether you agree with these things or not, there's a lot of descriptive claims being made here, predictions, whether that's true or not is, is up for debate. Um, and then he talks about uh, how it provides the private property, free market sort of thing, provides alternative sources of employment for unpopular persons who don't have to convince any one person or small group to hire them. I think this is a little weird. Um, 
So like, uh, it's kind of like protection for people who are not popular. And there might be something about this that you might think is objectionable, that like basically rich people can get by without having to be nice people or have relationships with anyone else or be respectful, you know, all those kinds of social norms that people who are poor have to deal with. You know, you can't get by, you can get by being a dick and being rich. You can't get by as easily being poor and being a dick, right? That's going to be a problem. Um, but I, I think there is something that is um, a little bit more charitable here for where Nozick is going with this. Um, and it's this idea that <clears throat> we shouldn't have a society in which I need to, like, make sure I'm not pissing everyone off around me in order to be able to survive. That uh, reward in society shouldn't be a matter of a popularity contest. Uh, just think back to high school or middle school and be like, yeah, I don't want to live in a society that's like that, um, where it's just a bunch of like catty infighting and everything. Maybe this kind of financial independence and autonomy is pretty important for general autonomy in, in society. Okay, so, um, ooh, I'm gonna have to wrap this video up here soon. We're getting close to the end here. But the main point here with Nozick and the proviso, the Lockean proviso, is that he thinks giving people ownership of this stuff, even when it means no one else has access to it, is justified uh, because it isn't worsening everyone else uh, in society. It's not putting them in a worse off position. It's actually improving. It's give, there's a lot that society has to benefit. If this sounds like social contract theory, there's a connection here. Um, so we're going to eliminate from our conditions about worsening the positions of others. We don't mean by that worsening by limiting the opportunities for appropriation or worsening by competition. Now here's the cool idea that Nozick leaves us with. I don't necessarily agree with him, but I still think this is clever and interesting. He says, if this is a constraint on justice in acquisition, it's also going to be a constraint on justice in transfer. So, for instance, uh, let's say uh, in our little village scenario, I, um, I mix my labor with all of the trees in the orchard, and now I own all of them. Now you no longer have access to it. And because I have a monopoly, I'm probably not benefiting your position either, no matter how tasty my fruits are. If I'm charging you an arm and a leg to just be able to eat to survive, then that's not my give, when society gives me ownership of the orchard, that doesn't improve everyone else's position. So that would be an unjust acquisition. Well, let's say uh, I don't just take all the trees in the orchard, and it's more like the scenario I described earlier. I take some, other people take others. And we've got a little economy going, and there's competition. And then you're like, I'm like, I'm slowly gonna buy out all of my competitors. And through justice, or through transfers of ownership, I come to acquire all of the trees again, and then I run my monopoly game, and then I uh, charge an arm and a leg. Now, my acquisition, or my, I'm using acquisition in an untechnical sense there, but the way in which I was able to uh, acquire all of the trees wasn't a justice in acquisition. It wasn't something going from unowned to owned but it was going from owned to owned. Uh, it just so happens we're in the same boat again. And that also is going to violate the Lockean proviso, and that would be an unjust transfer. So that's why Nozick is not a pure libertarian uh, in the sense that he approves of government restrictions and regulations on monopolies. So antitrust laws, Nozick is like, sounds good to me, okay? Because monopolies are not in the public interest. Um, by giving someone total ownership, that does worsen the situation for everyone else, so that would be an unjust holding. Okay, um, but then he says some other weird things, like, oh, oh, this is also interesting. Getting into this situation could also happen by accident, not me intentionally buying everyone else out, but maybe I buy some of them, right? But it's not a total monopoly. But then there's uh, a bunch of trees die, like um, there's a lightning storm, and the trees that I don't own end up getting hit by lightning and dying. And then through just accident, I suddenly find myself with a monopoly. That's also an unjust holding, even though no one was deliberately at fault, according to Nozick. And our little, maybe our, our uh, village council would be justified in saying, Tim, you're going to have to sell some of those orchard trees. We're going to have to break up your monopoly. Nozick's cool with that. He thinks that's all right. Okay, 
But there are some weird things that he says that you might find counterintuitive, but he are totally consistent with his theory. Let me talk about probably the most controversial one, and then we'll have to wrap up this video because I'll have to I have to get going here. Um, Nozick imagines this case. What if I formulate? I'm a scientist, a uh, medical scientist, and I formulate um, a cure for some terrible disease. Okay, so I've invented this. I own it. I have intellectual property rights on it. And I got a monopoly on it. And I start charging an arm and a leg for my medication. It's a life-saving medication. It's saving people's lives. People really want it. Demand is high. And I'm like, I'm going to charge you a high price for it. That might be slimy. But Nozick thinks it doesn't violate principles of justice. Why? Well, if I hadn't invented that medicine, no one would have had access to it. All I'm doing, even though I'm charging a ridiculous price that for most people can't, they can't afford, I am just, I'm, all I'm doing is adding opportunities. I'm not taking any opportunities away from anybody. I'm not worsening people's situation. If, if anything, I'm just benefiting it. I'm just not benefiting it for uh, people who can't afford my ridiculous price. So that would be a just holding according to Nozick. And the way, if I want to charge those prices, say, totally within your right to do so, because you're not worsening the situation of other people in society. No one is entitled to my labor or my genius or my efforts in formulating this compound or this medicine, whatever it is. No one is entitled to that. Um, what they might be entitled to are resources that they could have naturally available to them, and then if I take ownership of that, that takes it away from them, but as long as I'm benefiting them, that's okay. Right? That's the whole story here about the Lockean proviso. Okay. Um, but in this case, with the, the pat patent I put on this medicine, that's not worsening anyone. Now, Nozick does say this. He says uh, those kind of patents and intellectual property rights uh, should have an expiration date on them, and the reason is that, well, I was the one to invent it, but sooner or later, someone else would have invented it if I hadn't invented it. It's kind of like this uh, virgin territory of, of knowledge that we're slowly exploring, and uh, I happen to be the one to find it first, and so it's kind of because of me that we even have access to it at all, but the longer that time ticks forward, the likelihood that someone else would have found it increases. So then I can't lay, claim to any kind of exclusive right to it anymore. Um, so that's his way of trying to deal with anything that might sound counterintuitive about my uh, slimy um, pharmacology kind of uh, market tampering. Or no, that's not quite the right word, but sorry, I'm running out of words. You know what I mean. <laughs> the way in which I'm charging uh, unreasonable or, or just impractical prices for this drug that I invent. Okay, um, so um, the key part here about uh, Nozick's proposal at the end of the day with the Lockean proviso is this is not supposed to be an end state principle, but I, like I was remarking earlier, it's interesting that as Nozick's trying to defend his situation, he's not just talking about freedom anymore, but he's also talking about well-being. Like the monopoly problem is a well-being problem. Um, and and maybe not a liberty problem. Maybe there's a way in which the Nozick can respond and say, no, there's a way in which I can talk about this in terms of freedom. But that's where Cohen's going to step in and get interesting with this. When we get to Cohen next week, Cohen's going to ask us to kind of think more deeply about issues of what it means to be free for something. And how does that relate with private property rights? And uh, as I'll mention, and I've already, I'll probably say in the weekend update email here, um, Cohen is a socialist. He's a Marxist. He's kind of even a communist. We could probably go as far as to say he's de defending communism. But he's going to try to defend it on the grounds of libertarian arguments. And libertarians are probably like, the f what you'd imagine is like furthest away on the spectrum here, away from communism. Um, but Cohen is very clever and interesting at deconstructing, he has got an interesting analysis of how to deconstruct what we mean by freedom. And he's going to basically say, uh, private property rights do not promote people's freedom. Not, not like communal property. If we had conventions around communal property, we'd be able to do that better. 
So Cohen getting in here with Nozick and getting in here with Rawls is a very interesting discussion. There's so many cool things going on, um, but I'm going to leave it there. Um, Leeling, do you have any questions here before I, I uh, run off? How did this lecture go for you? Good? Oh, yes. Okay. Maybe we can talk about that after I stop recording. Talk about your paper. Okay. I will um, call this video good, and um, I will see you guys next week uh, for our final week of the, cl of the quarter. Um, I will be doing two more sessions like normal, so it'll be like a normal week. We'll have... Um, our lecture on Monday, and then we'll have our lecture on Thursday, too. And it will be on Thursday. There's no way I'm going to delay that unless something terrible, terrible, like some unforeseen emergency occurs. Um, but Thursday should be fine for me to give that lecture, no problem, even with the busy finals schedule. Uh, I've got it carved out where that should be fine. So Monday and Thursday, there's still going to be things happening. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, more updates on that in my weekend update and all the stuff coming up here. Uh, your papers are due tonight by midnight. Um, I am. I, I wanted to kind of make a general announcement here that uh, I am going to. I'm open to slightly late submissions. So uh, the whole reason for the, why this deadline is such a hard deadline is because of the redistribution of the papers anonymously for you to be able to do the research paper assignment or the uh, response paper assignment in time for next week, and that's not under the gun and you've got a comfortable amount of time to do that so I want to be respectful of everybody so what I've decided is that I will hold off on doing the anonymous exchange yeah that's right Leeling I'm gonna hold off on doing the anonymous exchange until 8 p.m. Saturday that is the absolute latest that I want to get them and if they're after that I am gonna put a grade penalty on there to try to motivate uh, and and have you <laughs> turn it in ahead of time if you can get it by tonight that's great um, if it doesn't get in right at midnight, if it's a little late, that's okay. If you can get it to me tomorrow afternoon, that's okay. But 8 p.m. is as long as I'm willing to kind of hold off on uh, doing this redistribution. Um, Leeling is wondering whether any reward credit for being on time by midnight tonight. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I, I'm going to have the late penalty be all that's going to happen here. Um, I, I'm willing to kind of compromise a little bit on this deadline um, because I, I've been talking with people and I know people are busy managing some stuff. Um, so I'm going to do that. Um, and it's not that much of a bump. So I, I won't do a special reward. Sorry, Leeling. Oh, and we need a code word. Um, um, how about... Tomato juice. I don't know why, but that tomato juice example from Nozick always makes me giggle of like mixing the tomato juice can in with the ocean. So we'll do that. Tomato juice is the code word for this one. Okay, I got to run. I'll see you all later. Stay tuned for the weekend update and good luck with everything. Um, stay in contact with me last minute here if you got questions. Bye.